So this morning we're going to be looking in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. And I was thinking about this. I've preached this message here in the church. It's been 13 years that I've preached on Palm Sunday. And again, it's a message, and so often we often say this as pastors, that we don't have to feel the need to add anything new to the text that is alive and living. So often I, I, I've heard of people that they'll try to add something and they take the context of the verse way out of what it's supposed to be. And my heart is not to do that this morning. My heart is this, though, is that the Holy Spirit reveals something to each and every one of us through this familiar account that we see here in, in Luke. Now, <clears throat> my title of my message this morning is simply this. Not our agenda, but His. Not our agenda, but His. And how many know that Jesus' agenda is always greater than ours? It always is. And, and He has an agenda. He has a plan. God has a plan. And again, we are involved in that plan, each and every one of us. Uh, we celebrate Palm Sunday, and it marks the final week of Jesus' life here on earth before His, his resurrection. Again, we've looked at this message in many different ways. I think the last time I preached it was the idea of a false coronation, a false crowning of a king. And again, we, we see that this is exactly what they did when kings or those that they thought would be able to bring salvation to them would come into Jerusalem. They would do these things as far as laying palms down and, and laying cloaks down. And so they would do this when they would king someone or crown someone. And so often as I was thinking about this, as I was writing this sermon, so often I think about how often my agenda differs from Jesus. And I think that we can all look inside and say, yeah, there's times when my agenda seems to be more important. But again, I want to remind you that Jesus' agenda is always greater than ours. You know, even his disciples didn't see the agenda that Jesus had. They missed it. And John 12, verses 13 to 16 actually tell us this. It says this in John 12, 13 through 16. So they took the branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it was written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey colt. And his disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. So we see even these guys that followed him, they didn't still have this understanding of who Jesus was and what his agenda was and why he'd come here to earth. And, and I'm, my prayer this morning is this, by the time we leave here, that each and every one of us, we understand why Jesus took this ride on a colt. That we understand why Jesus Christ came 100% man, 100% God to this earth. And so, I, I hope not one of us miss it. I hope anybody listening online that we don't miss it. You know, on this day, people honored him verbally. There was crowds, people upon people, that went ahead of him. And, and again, they, they threw out these palms and their cloaks and their robes, and they screamed, Hosanna to, son, to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And I think about them shouting this. And I've said this many times, but it, just within days, the same crowd will be shouting, crucify him, crucify him. We see that there was people there that were hoping to be saved from the oppression of the Roman Empire. But there was also in that crowd Pharisees, and we will see them in Luke 19. I think about 
the prophecies that have been fulfilled about this exact account this day as we celebrate this Palm Sunday. These prophecies were 450 to 500 years prior to Jesus' arrival. To him sitting on this colt donkey. Zechariah 9.9 and, and Psalms 118 that we've already read today. Prophecy after prophecy would be fulfilled. And Jesus would fulfill them. But yet, the people could not see. I sit back and I just say, I used to wonder and just question how. And again, we know the Word of God says that He blinded their eyes. He blinded their eyes. In Luke 19, 28-44, it reads this. And when He had said these things, He went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And again, remember, that's just referring to the elevation. And when He drew near to Bethage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, He sent two of His disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you'll find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. I was thinking about that. You know, again, so often we can read a portion of text and we can think that, that that's just normal. But I'm here to inform you this was not normal. This would be similar to today to for, for some of us to find a mode of transportation, hotwire it, and plan on using it. It would be pretty much this idea of using something that's not yours. And Scripture doesn't go too in-depth on this. But the one thing that I did gather out of this was this, is that he sent two of his disciples. And I was thinking about that. We see other accounts where uh, a, a ram gets caught up in a thicket. We see other accounts in Scripture where God actually caused the animals to come two by two to an ark. And how many know that Jesus could have just spoken this into existence? All you would have had to say is, I need a colt donkey. Father, send one. And there could have been a colt donkey that made its way to Jesus. But as I was looking at this text, again, you've often heard me say that we are plan. We are part A in God's plan. God's heart is that He wants to use His people, but let me remind you again, He doesn't have to. And again, here in this story, He sends two disciples forth to go get this donkey. Because God enjoys, God looks forward to using His people. He doesn't have to. But God wants to use each and every one of us in His plan. And again, I would ask and cause us to question and look and reflect in ourselves. Am, am I available to be used for God's plan? Listen, it doesn't mean that you're going to have to go untie a donkey somewhere. But we all know that God has a plan for each and every one of us. And one of those plans is to make disciples. Another part of that plan is to share the gospel. Are we willing to be a part of that plan? Because God wants to use you. And as we continue on here in verse 31, it says, if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You should say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away, they went and they found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. Now again, I don't know if, these people knew Jesus. I'm sure they knew about Him. You've got to remember, we are just showing just a few accounts of His miracles, His mighty deeds. Again, I always go back and I remind us that in the book, in the Gospel of Mark, it says that if all the miracles were contained in books, this world would not be able to hold them. That's a lot of miracles. That's a lot of healings. 
There's not too many people in this day that don't know who Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the carpenter, who he is. They know who they think he is, but they really don't know who he is at this point. And it says this in verse 35, And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the coat, they sat, they sat Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And he was drawn near already on the way down to the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Again, it was what they had witnessed that had caused them to have this celebration, to have this false coronation of Jesus. You know, Scripture tells us, blessed are those that have not seen but yet believe. I often say this, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if you believe that He is your only hope, that He is your Savior, you are blessed. Because I haven't seen Jesus. In fact, the Bible says that if I would have, I'd, I probably would not be here. I'd perish. I would die. But again, every time I open up the Word of God, it witnesses my spirit. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. It's not what I have to see, even though we can see God in His creation. We can see how God works in people's lives. We can see how Jesus saves. We can see, and I know the work that Jesus has done in my own life. So often, just like the Apostle Thomas, I, we have to see and we need to see to believe. Listen, don't base your faith off experiences. Don't base your faith off of things that you see only. And it says this, verse seven, 37, we'll reread it. It says, And as he was drawn near already on the way down to the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that he had done and they had seen. And then verse 38, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And I think about what these Pharisees were so upset about. Now, I, I need to remind you, just prior to this is when Jesus had healed his friend Lazarus, had raised him from the dead. And from that minute on, they were out to kill Jesus. The Pharisees were. In fact, the Gospels tell us not only are they out to seek and kill Jesus, now they're even contemplating killing the dead man that once was dead, was risen, and now alive, they're thinking about, how do we kill Lazarus? This mighty act caused a lot of people to come alive, to come awake. Not to who Jesus really was, but to someone they thought was going to be able to cause them to be free from the Roman Empire. It was a political uh, idea of if he comes into power, he will overthrow the Roman government. We've seen his mighty acts. We've seen what he can do. We've seen him even speak and calm the weather. And now we've seen him raise someone from the dead. And the Pharisees are so upset at this point. And again, they are confessing with their mouths that Jesus is king. Not only is he king, but he comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And again, 
they cry out. We don't see it here, but they cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us now. Or also in the Greek, that phrase can be taken as deliver us now. Save us now. The Pharisees, seeing this as total blasphemy, their eyes were blinded. But how many know that all creation cries out to God? And he makes it clear here, Jesus says this, as the Pharisees say, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answers them, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Listen, I encourage you during our praise time and to sing with all your heart. But more important is this, that our lifestyle is an act of worship to God. How are we living our lives? Are we living it as that? As an act of worship? As an act of declaring that He is King, that He is our God, that He is our Savior? I don't know about you, but I don't want no stones crying out in my place. And believe me, they would if we didn't. The Bible makes that clear. As we continue in verse 41 here, it says, And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. Now yesterday during Kim's celebration of life, I'd mentioned there's two places in Scripture where we see Jesus, he actually says that he wept. The first account was at Lazarus' tomb with his sister Mary and Martha. He's seen how they were moved, and that Greek word there is that idea that he shed a tear. That he shed a tear. Again, it wasn't this idea that he was sobbing, that he was wailing, because he knew that Lazarus was going to rise and be raised from the dead. He knew what was happening. He already declared that to his disciples. And he told them why. For the, your benefit, but also to glorify God. And so we see him in that portion just shed a tear. And I still believe, again, with many theologians, that again, it was the idea that the unbelief that was there, that was going on, that caused him to shed that tear. But see here, we have him being praised. We have them shouting out, Hosanna, Hosanna. They're throwing palms down and their robes and cloaks down in front of him. He is fulfilling prophecy that nobody's seen. Just incredible because they were blinded. His own disciples didn't see it. But here it says, and when he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it. This word weep here in the Greek means to wail, to cry in such a way that your body aches. And I can picture this in my mind. Here he is on this colt donkey. Everybody's screaming out, Hosanna, Hosanna. And here is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, just wailing and weeping because nobody got it. Nobody truly understood. And Jesus came to reconcile man to God. That was the plan here. And we're going to see this as we continue on in our text. So we see he's just weeping. And I can picture it. I mean, this word weep or wept here is that uncontrollable weeping. I, I don't know about you, but I've had those times. I've had those times where I just weep to the point that, man, I was hoarse. It felt like I had no more water in my body because I'd cried so much to the point that I hurt after I was done. This is the way that Jesus wept when he came into to Jerusalem. And in verse 42, saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day that the things that make for peace... 
But now they are hidden from your eyes. What was this peace? Listen, this was not world peace here. This was not the peace that these people were hoping for. That was not the peace and the relief from the Roman Empire. But this peace was that peace to simply reconcile man to God. And listen, if you are born again, you know what peace I'm talking about. The Bible makes it clear that we were all enemies of God before our salvation. And it was Jesus Christ and His blood that reconciled us back to the Father. And this is the peace that Jesus is crying over because He realizes that this is not taking place. But we know because the testimony of you sitting in these seats this morning, if you've been born again, that God's agenda is always greater than ours. Always. He is always the victor. Listen, our hearts long for peace in this world, doesn't it? Because, again, something's been planted in each and every one of us to understand that one day, and Kim understands this. Kim understands this. Debbie understands this this morning. They are in 100% peace. They're seeing a kingdom. They're seeing a place that, again, that there is nothing but peace and unity and harmony and beauty. And our hearts long for that. How many of you would love to see peace in Washington Township? How many would love to see peace in the city of Detroit? How many would love to see peace in the state of Michigan? How many would love to see peace in the United States? How many would love to see peace in the world? I don't doubt anybody here wouldn't want to see that or wouldn't want to experience that. But that is not the peace that Jesus is talking about here. How many of you, and you don't have to raise your hand, hands, your head, if you're sleeping, raise your head. But how many of you are so glad that you have a peace at night when you put your head on your pillow. And again, it might be after your prayer time where you've asked God to forgive you of those sins that you've committed. I don't know about you, but I can, and Missy can attest to this, I can hit the pillow and go to sleep pretty fast after our prayer time, after my prayer time. Because things are right between me And God the Father, because of what Christ has done, this peace that he said they're not receiving because it was hidden from their eyes. I don't know about you, but I am so glad that my eyes have been opened. I'm so glad that once I was blind, but now I see And Jesus continues here in verse 43. The days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that I didn't miss my day of visitation. The day that Jesus saved me. The day that I realized that I had a need for a Savior. I am so glad that God chose me. I think about this verse here in 43. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you. Now, Jesus' prophecies always came true because He's God. He's the Word. This event that Jesus is prophesying about will take place 38 years later. 
And it takes place when the Jewish people revolt against the Roman Empire in 67 A.D. And in 70 A.D., just three years later, the Romans, they've had enough. Caesar's, he's had enough of these Christians revolting, of these Jewish people, or I should say the Jewish people revolting. And they start killing Jews. In the writing of Josephus, who was a historian at that time, who has been accredited to being very accurate, during that time in 70 AD, 1.1 million Jews were killed. Think about that. 1.1 million Jews were killed. And 97,000 Jews were enslaved. Let's go back to our text real quick. In 43, For the day will come upon you when your enemy will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Uh, Can we throw that picture up on the screen real quick? Oh, it's up there. I didn't realize, and Dick had definitely cleared this up, but the picture I sent him the other day wasn't very clear. But you see this street right here up on the left. You can barely see it. It's just like a path there at the very top to the left. Yep, point up, 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 right there, right there. That is street level. You can go to Jerusalem today, And these stones and this structure is exactly the way it is still today. The Jewish people have not moved this. They've left it the way that it happened in 70 AD as a reminder. And I think to myself, these people who still cannot see what is revealed in God's Word... They leave this as a reminder because this is exactly what happened to the the temple. It's exactly what Jesus prophesied. Even though they can see it still today, they don't understand it. All they see it as is a time when 1.1 million Jews were killed and 97,000 were enslaved. They see it as a time when Rome came in and crushed them. In fact, this was so brutal. Let me just, again, in Josephus' writings, how he describes this. The Roman soldiers actually cut down trees from the Mount of Olives and they drug them into the temple. This is what Josephus writes. And the oil out of those trees that had given oil for years burnt so hot that the gold in the temple actually melted. And the the historians still today, and there's been cases where they still have plucked gold out of these stones and out of the brickwork from the temple because it got so hot the gold melted and went into the seams of the stones and rocks. It's just incredible. The people who cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save us, within days will be crying, crucify, crucify. Now how does this apply to us today? What do we need to see here? I think the first thing we need to see is, again, is that idea of Jesus sending his two disciples to get that colt donkey. I think we need to see that God still wants to use us in his plan, and it delights his heart for us to be used. But remember, God is sovereign. God is bigger than we are. And God doesn't need us for his plan but he delights when he uses his people. 
We see that throughout Scripture time and time again. I think the second thing that we need to see is that, again, that we need to be about the Lord's agenda, not ours. This whole account was those Jewish people was fulfilling their agenda of being set free from Rome, from the oppression. They didn't see the agenda of Jesus. They didn't see the agenda of the Lord. And and that was simply a peace. To be able to have peace, to be reconciled to God. The third thing I think we need to see here is is our praise just verbal? Because Jesus said their praise was just verbal. Is our praise just verbal? Or are we truly living to worship Him? Are we truly living a lifestyle of worship? When people see you, do they see Jesus more than they see you? That would be a good question to ask ourselves. I ask myself regularly. I this last, this last Thursday, I had, some of you were praying for me. I had to do a presentation with three other guys for our company over engineering and surveying that's going to be done on this $26 million project. And the reason why I was a part of it is because I'm the local guy. I've been there for 28 years, and I have the vast knowledge of how to filtrate water and the upgrades that's going to happen at that plant. And the two guys that I met with, I'd met with prior, and both of them are Christian brothers. So I was able to, again, I shared my testimony, or started to before one of them said, hey, we're, we're born-again believers also. And I was able to tell him I'm a bivocational pastor. But the third guy, he didn't know that. He says, I knew there was something different about you when I got to your water plant and on your desk I accidentally grabbed a paper and it had the Gospel of Luke and some scriptures there. He says, but then he just told me that you're a pastor. We could use that tonight. And I looked at him and I said, listen, everybody on that commission knows I'm a pastor. Everybody in that commission hall Most of them know that I'm a pastor. I said, because I've been in this community for years. Some of them have asked. Some of it's come up in conversation. So I said, I I don't think that that's really going to help us this morning. They know who I am. They know that I do my work unto God. They know that I've done everything unto the glory of God. So our question needs to be is this. Is our praise... Is it just verbally, or are we living to worship Him? Is it a lifestyle? Any of you that have ever, and, and, and it seems like this last two years, I've talked to people that have done online Christian dating. Listen, if anybody's going to do that, I'm not necessarily against it. But just simply ask them who the, who the disciples were. If they can't pass that test, tell them goodbye. Um, ask them how long Jesus' ministry, earthly ministry was. If they can't answer that, just say, hey, see you later. Listen, there's some testing you can do really quick, especially face-to-face. I don't give them time online. to They'll just Google it. But there's a lot of people out there in this world that they'll praise Jesus verbally. Some of them will praise him as just a great teacher. Some of them will praise him as he was a good guy. He did a lot of good things. Some of them will praise him and make him into something that he isn't. Just like this group of people did. All they wanted was to be saved. And again, it was being saved from the Roman government from their oppression. There's a lot of counterfeit Christians. Don't be one of them. Don't be one of them. In days to come, you won't have that luxury. 
You will not have that luxury. The fourth point here that I believe that we need to see is this. Are we receiving the peace that Jesus supplies? If you're born again, you have received that peace. You've been reconciled to God. You've been regenerated. Your heart of stone has been turned to flesh, and praise God for that. I can't imagine not having that peace. Take advantage, and what I mean by this is not in a bad way, of that peace. Live a lifestyle that doesn't hold unforgiveness towards someone else. Live a lifestyle that forgives quickly. Live a lifestyle that loves with the love of Jesus Christ. Receive that peace. Listen, in this world that we're living in, it's crucial that you have it. And Jesus Himself promised it to us. Upon His ascension, He says, I'm going to leave one, a helper, the Holy Spirit. And again, Jesus actually refers to the Holy Spirit as greater is greater or better than He. And what He meant by this is, is that He understood that He was going to go and He was going to have to take His place, the right hand of the Father. And again, as I prayed this morning, it says that He's interceding on our behalf. That brings me comfort to know that the Son of God, my Savior, is praying for me. I need it. I need it. But again, he said, I'm going to leave you a helper. And this helper is going to be with you now until eternity and through eternity. He's going to always be with you. I will say this a million times, Momentum Christian Church. It's the Holy Spirit inside of you right now. And in this church, I refuse to put him on the back burner. I refuse to make him out as the redheaded stepchild, as so many people do. I pray often to the Holy Spirit. Because he's the one that's here. Navigating and helping me walk through this world where I'm just a pilgrim. He's the one that brings conviction and correction. He's the one that when I open up the Word of God, He brings it to life. And when I need to hear what God's Word says, He reaccounts it. He brings it back to my memory. I understand why people are so scared because again, I, I, you, you know my past. <laughs> I've seen the Holy Spirit... Or, not really the Holy Spirit, but what they say is the Holy Spirit completely missed, misused. Uh, the Holy Spirit is not going to have us run around here clucking like chickens and ducks. The Holy Spirit's not going to have us slithering on the floor. We're not going to have any fire prayer tunnels here because none of that is biblical. But we will... Again, ask the Holy Spirit to lead and guide each one of us, to open up the Word of God to each and every one of us. We will, again, pray those 50 functions that Scripture shows us the Holy Spirit does. So again, just real quick, God wants to use us, each and every one of us. It delights His heart when He can use His children in His plan. Is it about our agenda? Or the Lord's agenda? Is our praise just verbally? Or are we living a life of worship to Him? And are we receiving the peace that Jesus supplies? If you don't know Jesus this morning, man, I want to talk to you after service. I want to tell you about the peace that Jesus is talking about in this passage. 
the peace to reconcile you back to God. And to have a peace in no matter what happens in your life. Listen, it doesn't mean that we're not once in a while shook or in the boxing term it's called hit where you hit and you see butterflies for a minute. Listen, things can come against us and things like that. Sometimes we're hit, but I don't know about you, but it it seems like it's quick that the peace that men can't understand comes and takes hold. Cause me not to panic, to lose my mind, but to believe in a God that sees all and a God that is sovereign. Will you stand with me this morning? If you are not saved here this morning, I want to encourage you again. Will will our elders raise your hands that are sitting out here this morning? If you're not saved, again, I I would love to talk to you, but these guys are just as equipped to tell you and share with you what Jesus Christ and what God did through the plan of salvation to where you can receive that peace today. And for you that maybe that you're here and maybe you've you've realized that maybe maybe my my agenda isn't correct. Maybe you're here today and you're just saying, man, maybe my praise is just verbal. Am I really living for Jesus? Only you can answer that. Only you can answer that. And again, the way that we answer that is simply looking in his word. It's truly judging ourselves rightly as we see a lot of times when we partake of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians. It's not comparing ourselves and saying, I'm doing a little bit better than Joe. I'm doing a little bit better than Stan. Man, I got it so much on George. He still swears once in a while. We got to stop comparing ourselves with each other. What we need to do is look at the Word of God, pause it, and allow it to do its work in our heart. But again, the only way that it can happen is through being reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, being born again. So this morning, as I pray, just truly examine yourself. You, you know where you're at. I know as I was writing this, I, I've examined myself. So let's pray together this morning. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the gift of your word. Your word has the ability to convict. It has the ability to encourage. It has the ability to discipline. It has the ability, again, to cause us to reflect. It has the power to change a life. It has the power to turn a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Your word says that, again, it's by the word, by the word of God that causes faith to be birthed. And so, Father, I just ask, Lord, you just speak to each and every one of us here. I think about the the people that were surrounded, Jesus, on each side of that road as they laid palms and their robes and There's a point where Jesus is just sobbing. He is crying. He is, again, just losing the, 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 uh, just overwhelmed with the unbelief and, again, the, the, the way that they were seeing him. They wanted him for what he could do for them and their own agenda. Father, cause us never to be that way. Cause us to wake up every morning saying, God, not my will, but your will be done. And that's a dangerous prayer, Father. That's a dangerous prayer for a person that prays that. When they wake up, God, not my will, but your will be done. Father, you delight in using your children. So, Father, you will allow us to see the opportunities in front of us. In front of us. And, Father, cause us, Lord, not... To miss them. Father, I pray that your 
with my brothers and sisters. Father, I ask, Lord, that you keep your hand on them until we return. God, again, I just want to thank you for your mercy, for your faithfulness, and for your love that we have all encountered. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.